Welcome to Module 4 of Genomic Selection. And in this module, we're going to investigate whether genomic selection is working or not using uh, references in this literature. There's three basic assessment schemes for to see whether genomic selection is working. And I've derived my figure here from a citation shown on the left, Salam et al. And in each of these, you do use phenotypic and genotypic data from a training population to build a model. And you use that model to predict the values of individuals in a prediction population. And uh, scheme number one is I'll refer to it. Here your training population and prediction population are derived from the same set of lines. They are uh, phenotyped in the same environments and you get the correlation of the predicted values and the phenotypes of the, uh, the prediction population lines to estimate the accuracy of genomic selection. This is a process also called cross-validation and we discussed it in the details of that in an earlier module. Scheme number two here the training population and prediction populations are different sets of lines, often phenotyped in different environments. And there could be different degrees of relationship between the training populations and the prediction populations depending on the study. The third scheme to assess whether genomic selection is actually working or not. Here you have a prediction population that's developed by crossing the best lines from the training population, developing uh, progeny from them and then phenotyping those progeny to see whether their the genomic selection model has accurate, been, been accurate in assessing their phenotypes, predicting their phenotypes. So here you have your training population, certain individuals are selected from the training population, you cross them and you get a population of progeny derived from those cross and then you try to predict the value of those progeny and see how your predictions match up to their actual phenotypes. So, in assessing the effectiveness of genomic selection, certainly there's many publications that use Scheme 1, cross-validation, to report on the accuracy of genomic selection. But the accuracy estimated in this fashion is likely upwardly biased as term, in terms of estimating the, the gains one might expect in genomic selection. Because here your training population and your prediction population are both evaluated in the same set of environments. So the impact of G by E is really not factored in to these estimates of the accuracy of genomic selection. Scheme 2 is certainly a less biased estimate of it because the training population and prediction populations are often, oftentimes assessed in different environments, which again is a little more reflective of the realities of plant breeding. And there actually are very few published reports at this time that actually assess the impact of genomic selection after going through cycles of recombination and selection as we would expect with as is assessed in scheme 3. Or there's very few reports that actually look at genomic selection compared to directly to phenotypic selection. So let's look at some of these studies and there's one that we'll start off with. It uses scheme 2 to assess whether genomic selection has been working or not. This is uh, done in uh, with various traits in spring barley and you see the citation here in the cover page picture. So one reason I did, chose to assess whether to present whether genomic selection at work is working or not in this fashion by using uh, examples from the literature is I find that these examples also are very really illustrative of how people are using genomic selection and can use genomic selection. So as you go through these, think back to your own breeding program and think about how you're doing your breeding, breeding compared to what these people are doing and also start to think about how genomic selection can fit into your program by looking at these examples. So in this study here though, the training population was 168 lines. They've been trusted over a number of years. They were actually 668 lines accumulated over years 1999 to 2004 with lots of data on those from a historical standpoint and these 168 lines were also the parents of the progeny that will be used that are tested later in this in the population as the prediction populations. Phenotyping of the training population they did take these 168 lines and tested them in trials from 2009 to 2011, two locations per year. It's a fairly large set of lines, 168, so they use an augmented design, two reps, six checks per block within a rep. 
and they also use this unbalanced historical data from the initial assessment of these lines uh, prior to 2009. They have a genotype with 1,536 SNPs. And here's a diagram again of this scheme. Here's our training population up here. This is used, the data here is used to build the prediction model. And here are our prediction populations. Here's the first one. It consists of 96 new breeding lines that were first tested in 2006. And these 96 lines are progeny from crosses among these 160 lines up here. So there's a high degree of relationship here between the progeny population and the training population. Here's another progeny population, new lines tested in 2007, 2008, 2009, and 10. So there's five different progeny populations that they'll be testing. And so they build the GS model using the data from the training population. They then use to see if this model can predict the phenotype of these 96 new breeding lines. And then they use that same genomic selection model to see if it can predict the phenotypes of these 96 new breeding lines. And here's some details on how those prediction populations were phenotyped. All right. Let's look at the results. And to simplify things, I'm just kind of averaged the results of each of the five uh, prediction populations into one value. So let's look at the grain yield. So you build the GS model based on the training population, and then we're going to get breeding values for each line in the prediction set and see if those predicted values are correlated to the phenotypes of the lines in those sets. And for grain yield, the phenotype, the correlation of the phenotypes of those lines and their predicted value was about 0.57. And that's pretty good for yield. So I would say genomic selection worked pretty well here in predicting the phenotypes of those lines. Resistance to Xerium head blight, now we have an accuracy of genomic selection of about 0.7. And that is really good. And same for these other traits here. So I think you'd have to conclude in this study that genomic selection was uh, the models built on that training population were able to predict the phenotypes in these progeny sets pretty well. They also looked at, compared whether you, the accuracy of genomic selection, whether you used only data from the contemporary trials, which was really balanced data for the training population, or whether you used historic data on the training population, which is an unbalanced data set, and what happens if you combine those two types. And in most cases, if you build your model using only balanced data from contemporary trials, it was more predictive, produced higher GS accuracy than if you used the historic data. We'll continue this discussion in the second part of Module 4.